I'm going to start in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. In verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord, another way to put that, is considering the Lord in all things, considering his view in all things, is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 20, wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. And then verses 24 through 30, because I have called and you refused, and I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have said at naught all my counsel with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distrust and Distress and anguish cometh upon you. They shall, they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despise all of my reproof. You can be seated. In these passages, it's talking a lot about wisdom. Wisdom is being described as a woman that must be pursued or sought after. Wisdom is being described as something that has high value. Wisdom is being described as something that uh, really matters and that wisdom is not just good and not just wonderful, but it's also available. It's wisdom's hand stretching forth to those that desire wisdom. Wisdom is being described as being available to all. But often it's not man's first choice. So it's, it's kind of a warning but also a description at the same time. Without that wisdom, without considering the Lord in all things, without having the fear of the Lord and being guided by his voice in all things, uh, destruction comes. And at that moment it will be too late to get the wisdom when in the middle of that trial. But it's talking about the importance of, of pursuing wisdom and, and, and being intentional about getting that. It was available, but they did not hear. It was available, but they didn't listen. They didn't pursue after it, is the warning. So it's important the Bible talks about pursuing wisdom and using that wisdom to navigate our situations, our needs, the things that we feel, the things that we think, the things that we see. We need to have the Lord's wisdom. It is wise to seek counsel when you have an important decision to make. The Bible says, for there is safety in the multitude of counsel. It is wise to have somebody uh, accountable in your life. It is wise to be accountable and to guard your heart and guard your mind. It's wise to consider the Lord in all of your decisions. And it's wise to consider the Lord and his views before you allow that feeling to consume you. Allow the feeling to consume your perspective of a situation. It's wise to stop and say, okay, what is the Lord? What would the Lord like me to do? What is the Lord's view of this right now? It's also wise to pursue healing and being whole, being complete. I'm challenged a bit in my spirit today. I'm challenged to to communicate that wounded soldiers are easy prey for the enemy. The military, they have a, a really kind of cool way of taking care of wounded soldiers. The Purple Heart, it was established by George Washington Uh, to honor those who were wounded in battle, to highlight their value, to make sure that they were not forgotten. To make sure that other people knew of the, the sacrifices they made and the, 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 the faithfulness that they had towards the, towards the cause. To honor them for their service. A wise soldier recognizes when they are wounded. A wise soldier knows that when they are wounded, though they still have value, they are a liability. They do not lose their value. They do, however, change the vantage point in which they may serve at that time. As such, a wise general does not send out wounded soldiers. And make no mistake, we are in a battle. We are in a war for our souls. We are in a battle and war for our minds and our hearts, our thoughts, our emotions. They are at constant war. And the enemy is trying to get them and trying to direct them in any way that the enemy can possibly provoke them to go. And I know that you have been given a great vision from God, but sometimes the general would tell that story, tell that soldier, I need you to stay at the camp a little longer. I know you desire to do great things for the Lord, but I I need you to stay at that base a little longer. The stitching that you have isn't ready to be taken off yet. It's not ready to be exposed yet, but you can still work. You still have value. Take this balm and help heal this soldier over here 
at this camp. That foot of yours is not quite ready yet to move in the way that it needs to move, but you still have value to add to the people. Take this sling and wrap it up for your brother. This cut is not quite ready to be exposed yet, but you still add value. Why don't you go over and teach the young guys and the young girls about warfare? Why don't you teach the young guys and girls about how to work as a group? Or why don't you teach the young guys or girls how to work together in unity? The danger of a wound that is not tended to. The danger is that we tend to focus on that wound. We tend to focus on that area and the heart lies to us about what is good for the wound. What do we need to, to meet that need of the wound? And the heart always lies and says to do this and says to do that. And it's the, the heart it lies to us and gets us into trouble. The danger of that is to believe that things are going really well. Well, all the while that infection spreads. The wound might provoke someone to believe that they need to prove the doubters wrong. But fail to realize that those doubters are really just the nurses and the doctors that care deeply about their recovery. They may not be the general, but they, they may not be the sergeant, but those nurses and doctors provide the balm to bring healing. They provide anesthetic and antibiotics and stitching to take care of those wounds. While wounds of a soldier in a physical battle, they, they have uniqueness to them. I'm not saying it's the same, but I, I still draw the principle of being wounded, the principle of not being quite whole. When wounded, the Bible gives us instruction, and the Bible gives us instruction that is very necessary to apply, very necessary to, to listen and follow after. We see in James 5.16, it says, confess your faults to one another, pray for one another, let them know that you're wounded, let them know that you're bleeding, let them know that you have a need that needs to be tended to, that you might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much when he knows what he's praying. Confess that wound, confess that difficulty, confess that fault that you might have. That way you can be restored and strengthened by the body. It tells us to connect the wounded area to the body. That's what it's saying. That, 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 that piece that is wounded, that piece that is not whole, it's telling us to connect it to the body. It's not telling us to cut it off. It's not telling us that it doesn't have value. It's not telling us to hide it, but connect it to the body. Connect it to the spirit. So we have all seen someone with potential in just which. I, I just wish that they would see the potential they have. I just wish that they could do that thing that could change their life. I just wish they could make that decision that would radically transform them. But it's the same with wounded people. We so badly want them to succeed, but that wound is bleeding and they need to take care of it, but they won't take care of it. And we so badly want them to succeed, but that wound is, is holding them back from that potential. If they could only get that one thing in order. If they could only give up their insecurities and their weaknesses to the Lord. I, I saw something the other day that it says that when we do not surrender our insecurities or weaknesses to the Lord, one of two things happen. We become consumed by either a tyrant, a tyranny spirit, or a timid spirit. We become full of a tyrant spirit or a timid spirit when we do not give up our insecurities. We, we, we struggle to pray effectively. We, we struggle to be able to hear our own voice and, and believe that it touches God when we don't give up those things. If they could only give that bitterness up, if they could only give those things up, if they could only forgive themselves, if they'd only stop being afraid and stop beating themselves up for things that they may have not thought they did a good job in. If only they would really learn to trust God, if they only just understood how much God loved them, then it would radically transform their life. See, it is, it is wise to pursue healing. It is wise to look at things through the Lord's perspective instead of our own because healing does not come from ourselves. Healing comes when our views and our perspectives come into an alignment with God. They come into an alignment with the Scripture that is where healing comes from. There's no other place it comes from but becoming aligned with the word and becoming aligned with his practices and his principles and what he teaches to do with those things. So you're, you're not here because of pity. You're not saved because of pity. You are here and you are saved because the Lord loves you. Because you are loved by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You were bled for because of love. Your testimony, it falls apart. It does not have power until you realize the love that the King has for you. 
How are you to impart love of God if you struggle to, 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 to comprehend the love of God in your own life? It is wise to fight for the understanding and receiving and the revelation and the joy and the reality, the truth of God's love for you. When we are healed, we're going to be able to be better and more clearly understand the voice of the Lord. That way when we battle and we're struggling to understand something like the love of God or something like the direction or will of God, we can simply go to his voice because we know his voice. And we can hear him saying, does not my faithfulness towards you tell you that I love you? Does not my blood that I shed for you convince you with evidence that I love you? Is my book of love that is written to you not evidence enough to, 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 to tell you that I love you? Is not my presence I welcome you into each day not evidence my love for you. See, when our spouses come home every day, we know that they love us. We know when they're faithful to us. We know when they, they care for us. We know when, when they look past our, our, our difficulties and our faults, we know that they love us. We need to understand that the Lord loves us. When, when I am not whole, when I am not uh, complete, I, I cannot be at my best for those around me. I cannot be at my best for my family. I cannot be at best for those that I'm trying to reach with the gospel of Christ. I'll only be able to give them a piece, a fragment of something that may not help them that much. I have to be whole in God to be at my best to do what he has called me to do. So we have to look at the scripture. We have to look at things and say, okay, uh, how do I pursue wisdom? How do I pursue healing? Well, we have to look at things. We have to have a perspective on things. Like, our responses in relationships will mirror our responses to God. Our responses in relationships, our responses to leadership, our responses with conflict and disappointment and different things that we navigate, those things reflect in our responses to the Lord. When leaders in our life say no or tell us something different than we want to hear, do you feel worthless? Do you feel like you're a failure? It's not true. But we often feel that way. When someone disagrees with you, do you feel the need to prove yourself or to fight with them just, or just to ghost them, just to go MIA and act like it never happened? Those things need to be healed. That's not a whole response. Our handling of disciples, they're going to mirror our revelation or lack thereof for who God is. How we handle people, it's going to mirror our revelation of who we understand who Jesus is. A principle that is really essential. Do not heal alone. Do not heal alone because what will happen is the enemy will come in and try to tell you things. The enemy will come in and tell you doubt and tell you things that you can't check with somebody because you're alone. So do not heal alone. Other areas to look at is forgiveness. Are there people that we need to forgive? Do we need to forgive ourselves? Do we need to reconcile a relationship? The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 32, it says... Be kind to one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We've got to evaluate those things. We've got to evaluate how we trust. Where is our trust level in our life? Do we have difficulty trusting people in our lives? Do we have difficulty trusting leaders in our life? Do we have difficulty trusting when God says something to us? How is our trust level? That needs to be looked at. How does unity look in our life? Do we have it? The thing that gets in the way of unity is one thing. It's a big, fat serving of self. Unity, self gets away in the way of unity. In Proverbs 13, 13, 10, the Bible tells us, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. How does love look in your life? Can we love without expecting something back? Is there someone that we struggle to love or be compassionate to? Is it hard to receive love? Is it hard to receive compliments? Is it hard to receive advice or counsel or encouragement from others? Things that are self-inflicted. Have we forgiven ourselves for things that we have done in the past? Have we forgiven ourselves for not being perfect? Have we forgiven ourselves for things not going as well as we wanted them to go and blaming ourselves for it? Have we reconciled those dumb decisions that we made and decided to make a new healthy path each day? So there's situations that need closure and resolution to them when we're pursuing healing. 
We have to be healed and we have to be whole. It's not just one area. It's not just one emotion that we have. It's not just one idea that we have. The Lord wants us to be completely whole. The Lord wants us to be healthy and whole in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, in our relationships. He wants us to be one. And for that to happen, we have to be a whole working body that is healthy and one together. Healing is essential. There's going to be important areas to evaluate whether or not we have healed. Healing comes again when our our views come into alignment with the Lord's view, come into alignment with the Word of God. We need transformation, and that comes by the renewing of our minds. That comes by renewing our perspectives and saying, okay, is this what the Lord would say about this? Is Is this what the Lord wants me to feel? Is this what the Lord wants me to think? It's no wonder why there are people who have a hard time bringing themselves to intercession to a place of intercession. Intercession, it's, it's that place where you're advocating for someone or something to our Heavenly Father. But if you don't feel like you belong at His feet, if you don't feel like you belong in the presence of the King, in the presence of your Father, you're gonna, you might struggle in that area. You might struggle to connect and be at that area because you feel you don't deserve to be in that place of speaking. We need a renewed mind. I know the Bible, that's, they, the Bible says that we deserve forgiveness. The Bible says that that person deserves forgiveness, but do you say they deserve forgiveness? I know the Bible says that we, we need to be kind, but do we think we need to be kind? All of these things have a role to play, and, and, and if we're whole. We, we can't keep an offense that they committed in your past, in your back pocket for later use. I've been guilty of that. You can't keep a rude thing that they said to you in your back pocket for later use. I've been guilty of that. You can't keep the memory of what they did or didn't do to you in your life in your back pocket for later use to discredit them when God starts to use them for the kingdom of God. So these are all pieces that are carnal. These are all places that uh, are wounds, and this is how wounds express themselves in, in in a child of God. We look at these things, and let me, let me tell you, there's, there's a trick of the enemy that he likes to use. Whenever that person, whenever someone's using this spirit, or whenever they're used to teach about a topic that they may have struggled with in the past, our mind says, yeah, but. Yeah, but remember when they failed? Remember when they were mean? Remember when they messed up? You know, the Lord does a work in people's life, and it changes them forever. The Lord does have the power to make something brand new and and let something be dead and and stay dead when we give it to him. You know, the Lord has done a work when when things that uh, are alive, that shouldn't be alive, they're put to death and then they stay dead. They're not allowed to be resurrected. You know that's when the Lord has done a work there. You, You know, the Lord has done a work when that man who has lived in bitterness is no longer bitter. You know, the, the Lord has done a work when that backbiter no longer backbites, but they become an encourager of the brethren. You know, when wrath turns into compassion, when anxiety and fear, it turns into love and faith. When discouragement turns into zeal for the kingdom. When rebelliousness turns into submission. When isolation, it turns into unity. When selfishness turns into submitting one to another. And when pride turns into humility. So God wants something to be done in those areas that we are not strong in. God wants something to be done with that difficult thing that is in our heart and difficult thing that we wrestle with in our mind. He wants to turn it into something powerful. He wants to transform it into a strength for the kingdom of God. He wants to change it so that it would not be yours anymore. It wouldn't be mine anymore, but it would be a tool for the kingdom. He has a plan for those difficult things that are in our life. He has a plan for those difficult situations and those worries and fears and concerns that we think about throughout the day. He's not, his, his will is not for them to be left alone and you just struggle with that specific thing for the rest of your life. That is not his will. The other day, I, I was working and God spoke to me. I was going about my day just doing regular things, throwing boxes everywhere in a delicate, nice manner. They're all put together, no damage to the boxes. I was going about the day, but God spoke to my spirit. He says, wounded spirit or wounded soldiers are an easy prey for a spirit of flattery. You might look and you might wonder, what, what is a spirit of flattery? In Luke chapter 4, we have a, a pretty well-known passage. Jesus is going into the wilderness Spirit led him into the wilderness. The Spirit led him into a trying ground. The Spirit led him into that. <coughs> he went and fasted 
and was tempted by the devil for 40 days. During this season, if you will, Satan tried to take advantage of the physical weakness of Jesus. Physically, he was weaker than his normal state, but spiritually, he was strong. Spiritually, he knew exactly what he was doing. Satan approached him, and to paraphrase, he says, aren't you the son of God? Aren't you all powerful? Can't you do anything? He then proceeds to suggest that he makes stones into bread, among other things, to prove that he's all powerful, to prove that he has value, to prove that he is who he says he is. And this spirit, this, this flattering spirit, I'll tell you what the goal is of it. The spirit's goal is to get you out of position, spiritually. This spirit's goal is to, put you, to, bro- to provoke you to move to where you're not supposed to move to. It is to make you to feel discontent with what you're doing. It's to make you feel that what you are doing does not measure up to what you are called for. It is meant to tell you that you are not, what you are doing does not measure up to what God has called you for. What I'm doing doesn't have a lot of value. What I'm doing does not have significance. What I'm doing will not lead me to where God is calling me to go. Those crazy, ludicrous thoughts. That spirit will send thoughts into your mind. Well, what are you and your talents doing in that city? What are you and your talents doing in that ministry? Why aren't you doing such and such? Why aren't you a part of this or why aren't you a part of that? Why are you wasting time doing that, what you're doing? Nobody sees you doing it. It's not significant. It is to provoke you to feel that what you are doing currently doesn't carry any weight spiritually in the long run. And it's a lie of the devil. That is a lie of the devil. When we become consecrated, when we become focused on the Lord's will and full of his word and full of his spirit, it is then we can turn to the enemy and speak and tell him it is written. It is then we can turn to him and say, yeah, I'm wounded, but it is written for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. My value was established long ago on a cross that was stained with blood. I may be wounded, but it is written, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproofs, in necessities, persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It is then we can turn to the enemy and tell him to flee. It is then we, we, we can resist the devil and turn and walk in truth. We have to get to a place where we have a revelation of these things. We have to get to a place where we can confidently say and boldly say, I trust the Lord. I trust his direction. I trust his voice. I trust where he put me. I trust where and when he put me. I'm not moving until he says to move. I won't change my position until he changes my position. I won't change my mind until he says, change your mind. I won't change how I feel about it until he says, change how you feel about that. See, there is more to healing than it just not hurting anymore. Part of being healed is not being skeptical when someone who walks in the Spirit speaks into your life. But rather trusting and knowing that they hear from God and they love you. Part of being healed is not questioning every prayer that is prayed over you by someone who walks in the Spirit. But rather trusting and knowing that they hear from God and they love you. And God loves you enough to send someone to speak over you. That's how much God loves you. It's not just some random person speaking random things into you. It's the love of God. It's the word of God that speaks truth into your situation. You have to choose to trust in the Lord. You have to choose to trust in his love for you. You have to choose to trust in his plan for you. Not every season is going to be easy. Not every season is going to be simple. Not every season you're going to know what to do with it. You're not always going to have the answer for what season you go through. You're not always going to know exactly what to do in that relationship, in that circumstance. You're not going to have all the answers. But we have to trust the Lord and know that he put us in this position to learn what he wants us to learn. That we have to trust the Lord that he put us here and he has a plan for us here. We have to trust the Lord. We have to choose to trust in the family of God that he has put us in. 
the people that he has connected us to, you better choose to trust them. Because the Lord puts you there. The Lord connected you to them. The Lord puts you in their life. We have to choose to believe the best from them. I'm not going to be skeptical. I'm not going to doubt the people that God put in my life. I'm going to believe the best. I'm going to believe their intentions. I'm going to believe their motives. Because I will trust the Lord. And I will trust in how he does it. And if the Spirit of God led me to this point... How can I question that he's leading me after that? How can I question that he's bringing me to that next step and that next place? How can I not trust him when he brings me into a hard situation? The trust of the Lord doesn't stop or doesn't change based on our circumstance. Our circumstances change, but the love of God does not. Who God is does not. It doesn't change. That doesn't change. He remains the same forever. The same God that took you out of your sin is the same God that puts you here now. The same God that loved you when you were broken is the same God that put you here now. It's the same one. It's the same God. The same God that filled you with the Spirit. The same God that forgave you of your sins is the same God that put you here. It's the same one. I have to choose to trust him. I have to choose to be honest. I have to choose to be vulnerable. I have to choose to be healthy. Because our nature, how we are as humans, it is not to be healthy. It is not to trust. It is not to be vulnerable. When's the last time you chose to be vulnerable with someone who had the authority to speak into your life? It was the last time that you gave someone a little bit of authority, a little bit of room in your life to speak to you and say, hey, you know what, I think such and such. It's not simply the hard thing goes away in your life. That, that is not the complete healing that the Lord speaks about. But it is, the, it is that thing that is hard that God takes care of it, but then he replaces it with something. He transforms you with something greater. He transforms you with something better. He transforms you with something stronger. That is when there is health. That is when there is wholeness. Oh, I used to struggle with this thing. Great, God took care of it for you. Thank you, Jesus. But what is there now? Oh, I used to struggle with doubt. I used to struggle with temptation. I used to struggle with bitterness. But what is there now? What is the tool that you allow God to build in you to replace that thing that used to be there? It is a testimony to not have to deal with the things that we used to deal with. That is a testimony. Thank you, Jesus. But that's not the end of the testimony. That's just a piece of it. That's just the beginning of it. That's just step one of that testimony. He, he, he takes us. He washes our, our sin away. And then he builds us. He builds us as long as we trust him, as long as we trust in the family of God, as long as we trust in the processes that he has written in the word. There is processes. There is, there is a way to, to, to handle every situation. There is a way to deal with every conflict. There is a way to deal with these things. And they're not our way. They're the Lord's way. They're, they're not my way. They're not the preacher's way. They're not the pastor's way. They're not the worship leaders. They're not the Sunday school's path. They are the Lord's path and the Lord's things that he has created. It's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. We have to choose to trust. If we could stand for just a moment. The really amazing thing about the process of healing is it's terribly hard to start it. It is terribly hard to start it. If you've ever been wounded and you battle with things inside and you're like, you think all sorts of thoughts, you have all sorts of emotions, all these worries and fears, and you have these things, oh, what if this happens, and what if this happens, and what if this person says this, all these things. And when you first speak it, you guys know the experience, when you first speak about that issue, it hurts coming out of your chest. It hurts coming up your throat. And it's like, oh, this, this is terrible. This is awful, and I don't want to deal with this. But when you, when you finally speak that, think of it when you first repented to the Lord, and you finally gave up that sin. You finally gave up yourself and your will to God. How amazing was that when God met you right there, and he gave you something so much better. And you're like, why in the world did I hold on to that so long? Why in the world did I hold on to that sin, that addiction, that issue so long? Man, my life is so much better without it. My life is so much better without the brokenness, without the anger, without the strife, without the violence, without the bitterness. Man, my life is so much better without it. We have no business holding on to it. We have to make the choice to let go of it. 
And it, sometimes it's not as simple as going to the altar and praying about it. Sometimes you pray about it and God says, okay, now go share it. Go connect with the body. They can help you. Go connect with that person. They can give you wisdom. They can, they can be someone who loves you and prays for you and prays with you and walks with you through it. Because that is most often the resolution for healing is you have to walk with somebody. 